NASCAR addresses the DVP controversy. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. should have been required to fix his car, and no, Kyle Larson did not alter the outcome of the race on Sunday. Welcome back to Break Hard, I'm Matt. The internet is unhappy. They're unhappy most of the time, but after Talladega on Sunday, they're really unhappy. They're mad at NASCAR for the DVP issue. They're mad at NASCAR for not requiring Ricky Stenhouse Jr. to fix his car. And they're also mad at Kyle Larson for what they think is altering the outcome of the race. Spoiler alert, it's not. We'll start off with the DVP issue real quick. So obviously on Sunday, um, in the closing laps of the race, Austin Cindric gets turned by a bad push by Brad Keselowski via you know Joey Logano behind him, turns him, he collects 28 cars. Uh, the largest ever wreck by car count in the NASCAR Cup Series. Record-setting day, but not a record that you want to set, um, unfortunately. So there's a lot of wrecked race cars. They're all sitting down in turn three in the grass on the apron, uh, just scattered all over the track. Well, if you remember back to Kansas a week ago, Josh Berry gets spun out on the first lap of the race, and because he was deemed to be in the wreck, because he couldn't drive his car back to pit road because he had four flat tires, NASCAR ended his day. They said, you're done because you would need help getting back to the pit box, your day is over since you were involved in the wreck. Now, everybody was like, that's ridiculous. Even Brad Moran came out on Sirius XM NASCAR this past week and was like, yeah, it looks bad. That's something we're going to have to look at. He should not have been out of the race. As Ronnie Childers said, we didn't come here to run half a lap, stay in the car. Josh stayed in the car and they dropped him off in the campground and we're like, your day's done. So flash forward to this weekend, Sunday, Talladega, you have a ton of cars. They're sitting down on the infield. They have damage. They were involved in the wreck. They cannot drive back to the pits. And as Josh Berry said, when he came out of the infield carriage center, he said, there's a lot of cars sitting over there that should not get towed back to their pits. Their days should be done. Well, that's not what happened. Instead, NASCAR hooks up multiple cars, including Chase Elliott, Chase Briscoe, both playoff contenders, Harrison Burton, not a playoff contender anymore, takes them back to their pit box and allows the teams to put tires on the car, make you know, the repairs that are needed to the cars, put them back out on the racetrack, they're allowed to finish the race. What the heck happened here between last week and this week? So NASCAR Vice President of Competition, Elton Sawyer, spoke to the media after the race, and this is what he had to say about that incident. Um, and looking at what happened there with the four car, uh, we felt like, yeah, we, we probably could have made a different call, uh, call there. We had a good car that probably just needed tires last week. So as we went into this week, we wanted to err on the side of the of the competitor. Again, we don't want to put good cars out of the race. Um, we had a situation in turn three where we've got 25 plus cars down there. We're not sure why they can't continue. We don't know if it's strictly because they're just in the grass, they're high sided. Uh, so for us to make a determination that you know they've got some suspension damage and can't continue, um, that puts a lot on us that, again, we want to err on the side of the competitors. Once we got the 14 and the nine back to pit road, they, they made their small repairs that they can make on pit road and went out and met minimum speed. So we felt like we made the right call there. So essentially what happened here is they decided to err on the side of the competitor this week, that being the drivers. And instead of ending their day like they did it to Josh Berry a week ago, they decided to change it this week and allow them to continue on. Now, I don't disagree with that. I actually am totally fine with that. However, that being communicated would have been very nice. Instead, it seems to have been updated in the super secret rule book that nobody has access to. The communication is the issue here. I'm fine with them taking cars back to the pit box to have them repaired. I don't love the fact that nobody knew about it up to this point. So everybody's sitting around being like, well, this is unfair to the four team last week who got screwed over by this. But now, we're having guys go back to the pit box with way more damage. Josh Berry had essentially no damage. He just got slightly touched and spun and blew four tires out. These are wrecked race cars. The other issue that I had with what Elton Sawyer said here is he's like, we have you know 25 plus cars sitting down there. We don't know how they ended up there. I can tell you how they end up there. They were in a gigantic wreck that happened on the backstretch. How do I know that? Because they are wrecked race cars in this situation. I didn't like that portion of his statement. I like that they're taking the cars back. Don't get me wrong. I understand that. I understand what he's saying here too. But your race control, you should have an idea on what is going on uh, around the racetrack. I get it. It's hard to see. There's cameras around the racetrack though. And you can go ahead and assume that if they ended up there, it's because they were involved in the accident. Yeah, maybe there's a situation where somebody gets beached in the in the grass because they drove down there to avoid. They spin out. They don't actually make contact with anybody or anything. And now they're stuck in the grass. I get it, right? There's certain situations like that. But it's the lack of communication that was frustrating. However, if that's the way that they're going to officiate it going forward, totally fine with that. 
That's a welcome change. So hopefully that's how they call it for the rest of the season. But in the moment, it was very confusing and had a ton of people sitting around being like, what's happening now? It's like pass interference in football. Is it pass interference? Is it not pass interference? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. It's frustrating, but hopefully now going forward, it will all be called the same, hopefully. Moving on to the Ricky Stenhouse issue. People were upset about the DVP thing. NASCAR is con and, you know, consistently inconsistent. Now we get to the issue of Ricky Stenhouse. When the two car of Austin Sender got turned on the backstretch there, he made contact with the 47, the side of the 47 of Ricky Stenhouse, and knocked a big hole into it. I mean, that would have sank a seaworthy ship. There's a glaring hole there. The door foam is messed up in it, and by rule, it should have been fixed. Section 3.3.3.7 of the NASCAR Cup Series rulebook states States, A, energy absorbing, <clears throat> states, energy absorbing foam blocks must be installed on the outside surface of the left and right side doors. Goes on to further say, point B of this is door foam that has been damaged or crushed must be replaced. Effective May 4th, 2022, door foam that is missing skin, including all machine foams, must be replaced. So, the door foam was damaged. It was broken. It should have been replaced. The door skin, damaged, broken, should have been replaced. Now, I know people are going to say, that's nitpicky. They shouldn't have to repair it. It didn't affect the car. I don't disagree with that. He still won the race. Didn't affect the outcome of the race. However, this is a big time safety issue. You're essentially looking at, what, two thirds of you know the way into the cockpit there have been breached. The outside door skin was broken. The foam was broken. That now leaves just the inside uh, portion that is there. Yes, of course, there is a roll cage, but in terms of you know something that could get through there, it could still go through that third layer. That's the safety issue in this instance. I'm a person that will always err on the side of safety when it comes to racing. It should have been fixed. It did not get called. And I think the unfortunate part is Elton Sawyer was asked about it after the race. And he said, that's the first I'm hearing of it. He was not aware of it, which again is frustrating because the leader of the race has a hole in the side of his car. Race control should have an idea about that. Now, I understand there are 25 wreck race cars down in turn three. Emphasis was put on that, getting everybody back to uh, it back to racing, even though the whole red flag got lifted, everybody got to start to work on their cars and the pace car didn't roll for a little bit, even though we were back under caution. That was another big sticking point as well. Um, which, you know, to Ellen's credit, he said, that's a fair criticism. They should have been better. They should have changed it. They'll be better next time. Okay. Sinhaso should have had to repair the car, did not. And multiple different crew chiefs and crew members pointed it out to people in the media. Mike Kelly was asked about it, Ricky Stenhouse Jr.'s crew chief, post-race, and he's like, I'm sure they did point it out to you. Uh, but he kind of steered away from it and didn't admit that there was a hole in the side of the race car. Either way, it's a safety issue. I don't have a problem with him running with it. It's just more of like, yeah, if there was a wreck that happened, something bad could have happened in a situation like that. But you know, at the end of the day, nothing bad happened, so it was all fine and dandy, I guess. That brings us to the end of the race. Now people are upset about this on Monday morning. I saw a clip of the final restart, the last two laps of the race, uh, from the onboard of Kyle Larson with his uh, radio transmission uh, overlaid it. Of course, somebody clipped it off of the NASCAR website. And in there, coming to the checker flag as they go you know, out of turn four into the tri-oval, Tyler Mon, who is Kyle Larson's spotter, says, quote, don't push him to the win, though. Don't push him to the win, though. Meaning don't push Brad Keselowski to the win when Ricky Stenhouse Jr. in a Chevrolet is on the outside in contention to win the race. Larson, of course, doesn't push Brad Keselowski to the win and not for a lack of trying. It was literally six one thousandths of a second that separated the two of them. I tweeted out that quote. Nothing about it. I think it's interesting to hear when spotters are talking to their drivers. I tweeted out a quote from Daniel Suarez earlier. Um, on Monday morning when talking about where he should put his car when the pack was about to come get him. Something I kind of do every single week. I don't think that anything was wrong with what Kyle Larson did. But man, did the internet immediately come out and be like, that is race manipulation. He's altering the outcome of the race, except he did. It's not race manipulation. 
because he was 100% throttle the entire time coming to the line. He just couldn't get back to the six to give him a shove. Bozy posted the SMT data in response to my tweet. And I feel bad for Larson and Tyler Mon and everybody at that five team because I wasn't insinuating they did anything wrong. The internet immediately jumps to assumptions that you're you know, insinuating that there's a conspiracy here. There's not. I just thought it was interesting, especially as we continue to hear talk at every single super speedway race about not pushing a rival manufacturer to the win. That's all. That's all my tweet was just the fact that it was brought up, but he still stayed at hundred percent throttle. He just couldn't get back to the six to shove him to the victory. And listen, Kyle Larson's really, really good. Kyle Larson's not good enough to know the difference between six one thousandths of a second when he's behind a guy or not that he's not going to win by that much. No. I mean, if Kyle Larson had an opportunity to win that race, he was going to take it. And Brad should have probably moved up to block the 47 when he was clear off the corner, but didn't do that, uh, which would have set up well for Larson. But there's no conspiracy here. It's not race manipulation. And even if he, you know, didn't push Brad to the win when he could have, it's still not race manipulation because it's a really, really difficult thing to prove. Also, people are like, well, he's not running 100%. There's a 100% rule. Okay, fine. How do we talk about fuel saving races then? Not running 100% then, sometimes running 50%. Did everybody manipulate this race throughout the day when they were running 60% 60% throttle for 80% of the day? Nobody wants to talk about that. No, not everything is a conspiracy. I just wish people would understand that. Not everything has, you know, everybody has an ulterior motive to something. Nobody's trying to manipulate the outcome of the race. For Kyle Larson, it didn't matter if Brad Keselowski won that race or if Ricky Stenhouse Jr. won that race. Neither of them are playoff drivers. Neither of them are locking into the next round. Neither of them affect the points for Larson or his teammate William Byron on the outside. It was a guy that was still running 100% throttle the entire time, just couldn't get back to the six car to give him that push to get another, what, four inches out in front to potentially win that race. So Larson did nothing wrong. There was no race manipulation here, as bad as some people want it to be. Does the manufacturer alliance thing get annoying? I can certainly see why it would be annoying, but it's not going to change anytime soon. So yeah, no, Larson did nothing wrong. So let me know what you think about NASCAR's explanation for DVP and that issue that was going on there. Uh, the Ricky Stenhouse Jr. door foam issue, as well as Kyle Larson and what his spotter Tyler Mon said to him uh, coming to the checkered flag. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.